for some reason I found, and I think that, you know, there's perfectionist tendencies that we have as personality traits, like I'm that way. Um, but for some reason, nutrition is one of those things that even for an individual who's not usually a perfectionist, when it comes to nutrition, that's like one area that we always try to place that unnecessary pressure on ourselves to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to have those conversations about like what failure actually means and why it's a good thing and how we can learn from it and how, you know, the middle ground is kind of where the magic happens. This week's episode is with Mike Milner. Mike has been a high level nutrition coach for almost 10 years. He has a gift for understanding the psychological and physiological needs of his clients, which has led to thousands of success stories. His personality-based approach with an emphasis on mindset has been featured in TibArmy.com, Nutritional Coaching Institute, Everforward Radio, True Transformation, and many others. So in today's episode, we're taking a deep dive into personality types and how your personality can potentially play a role in your nutrition and training plan. We also discuss how to ditch the all or nothing mindset, why consistency is key in any transformation, and how always eating less can ultimately lead to weight gain. So lots of awesome stuff in today's episode, and this was a really, really great conversation with Mike Milner, and I know you're really going to enjoy it. So let's jump right in. All right, welcome back to Metflex and Chill. This is your host, Rachel Gregory, and I'm here with Mike Milner. What's up, Mike? How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited you're here. We just chatted a few weeks ago on your podcast. I had a lot of fun doing that. Um, but before we kind of get into the gist of things today, do you want to share? You can obviously tell us about your podcast. Tell us about yourself, how you kind of got into the nutrition and fitness industry. Yeah, for sure. So my podcast is called Mind Over Macros. And as you mentioned, you were just on my uh, on my show. So for everybody listening, you can go check out that episode. I don't have the number off the top of my head. I probably should have been prepared with that, but <laughs> oh, good. You can find it on there. Uh, yeah, I've been in the industry for a little over 10 years now. Um, started as a personal trainer. I mean, really, I got into this like most of us because of my own struggle, my own personal journey. Um, growing up an athlete, always played sports my whole life, never had to worry about how I looked, uh, but definitely had some uh, body image issues that ran in my family, eating disorders that ran in my family. And I always felt like the lucky one, like, oh, I'm the one that that didn't get those things until I did. Um, and which happened right around college, uh, once organized sports ended, and I picked up a lot of typical college kid eating habits and drinking habits, uh, I found myself at 250 pounds. And didn't recognize the person I was looking at in the mirror. And when you grow up an athlete, oftentimes your social circles, your friends, like it's all through sports. So I felt like I couldn't, I didn't want to be seen by people that hadn't seen me in a while for, because I knew the questions were going to come. Like, how did you let this happen? All of that stuff that played in my head. So my solution was let's rip the bandaid off as fast as humanly possible, which looked like hours of cardio, restrictive diets, chronic dieting. And I spent years in that cycle uh, which was not very fun. And uh, ultimately, that led me to finding strength training, which was like my first paradigm shattering moment, like I didn't have to do cardio all day, every day, I could actually lift weights and enjoy myself. And then uh, so that was how I got into personal training and really still kind of struggled on the nutrition side and saw a lot of people in the gym who were showing up every day putting in the work, but never really making progress and in having those conversations, it was always the nutrition that seemed to be the missing piece. So I kind of found my passion on the nutrition side, became a coach and uh, have been doing that for a long time now and uh, started my own, my own company about three and a half years, ago, uh, three years ago, a little over three years ago. And uh, yeah, and then that's where we're at today. That's awesome. And so with your company, do you focus on, you focus on both nutrition and, and training programs for like individual clients or? Yeah, we do. Um, it's mostly nutrition lifestyle. Uh, we have a lot of actually coaches and trainers that are clients of ours. Um, but we also provide a lot on the training side of things as well. So, you know, through my, I, I worked for another company as a nutrition coach for a, for a few years and really just felt like, the approach was very cookie cutter. And mm -hmm. I learned a lot of things that I didn't want my company to be. And so kind of shaped it around more of a personalized approach and really understanding each individual as an individual. We talk a lot about mindset. We 
really focus on communication. We really focus on meeting people where they're at and just not, you know, trying to get out of this like dietary dogma of like the one size fits all standard approach. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. That's something that I'm very passionate about as well. Um, speaking of mindset, so your podcast is called Mind Over Macros. How did you come up with that name? Uh, I don't even know. I was just like thinking about what I wanted my podcast, the overall theme and wanted I what I wanted it to be. And like, the, I think because of my background, I became very obsessive with macros. And like I said, the company that I was working for, they were like a strict macro based company. And I, a lot of times when I talk about macros, people are like, why are you so against macros? I'm not against macros. I use macros. I prescribe them at times. I just feel like sometimes we have to understand that it's just one single tool in the toolbox. It's not mm -hmm. the holy grail or the end all be all of nutrition. And what I had noticed was that a lot of people were getting very obsessive with their macros. Like it was causing stress. If, and this was my own personal story. Like it was causing stress. If you couldn't track perfectly, you would, you know, avoid going out and being social because how do I know what's in this restaurant meal? And mm -hmm. when I was working for this other company, it was like, if the person wasn't dead on their macros and like they were the problem and it was like, just hit your macros and you'll be fine. And the person's like, well, I'm struggling. Maybe I don't know if this is right fit for me. And it's like, if you would just shut up and follow the plan, you'll be fine. <laughs> And it's like, that's not real coaching and yeah. kind of digging a little bit deeper. You start to realize that if we can just get the mindset stuff in order, like the macro stuff, the physical stuff, the nutrition, that's pretty easy. Usually we get in our own way because we're either impatient. We're trying to rush the process. We have this all or nothing mindset. We have perfectionist tendencies where we're like, oh my God, if I'm 10 grams over my carbs, the world is going to end. And there's a lot of mindset issues that need to be taken care of first, in my opinion, before, you know, we're, we're trying to just like mask it with a macro plan. So inevitably, I eventually I landed on mind over macros, meaning mm -hmm. mindset is more important than macros. Yeah, I think that that makes complete sense. Like the macro side of it, macros are a tool, it's something to, to use to help you get closer to your goal. But like you said, there, there's so many other lifestyle factors involved that are just so overlooked, I think, because maybe they're not like sexy or like things that people talk about all the time. But I feel like those are kind of the found, like if you don't have the foundation, it's, you know, that a lot of people talk about like building a house, right. And using that as your kind of, um, how you look at transformation, like if you don't have the foundation in place, then all the other stuff doesn't really matter because it's, yeah, maybe it'll work for a little bit, but it, eventually it's going to fall apart. So, um, yeah, I totally agree. So let's chat a little about a little bit about mindset and maybe the psyche and kind of personality and how how you think personality plays a role and personality type plays a role in um, individualized nutrition. Yeah, for sure. So this was something that I had struggled with for a while because my personality type, I am somebody who gets bored very easily. So my background, I would try diet after diet after diet. I would, you know, I had the classic shiny new object syndrome. Same thing with training. It was like, all right, well, I'm going to get into CrossFit this week. And then I'm going to get into bodybuilding this week. And I'm going to get in powerlifting. And just, I never stuck with anything. And I would see other people being successful with certain programs and would always wonder like, what's wrong with me? Why can't I stick with anything? Uh, always kind of looking for the next thing. Uh, one of my early mentors was uh, Christian Thibodeau, who is a writer for T Nation and um, he was like the first real coach that I was like, all right, I need some help. And he explained to me, and he's like, you know, stop fighting against your personality. You are somebody who craves variety. We should lean into it. We should work with your nature versus fighting against it. It was like the first time that I had permission to just be me instead of feeling like a failure because I couldn't fit into like somebody else's way of doing things. Uh, and it was the same thing, like with, with nutrition thinking like, okay, well, I have to do, I remember one of the first programs was like intermittent fasting, you can't eat until two o'clock. And I'd be like staring at my phone, like ravenously hungry. And I'm like, I just want some food, but I can't, can't do it until it's two o'clock. So like I would, and then I would beat myself up, like what's wrong with me. And mm -hmm. he was the first person that like gave me permission to just be me. And once I started digging in a little bit um, to the science of it, it was like, this makes so much sense. Like with, you know, I, I have always had a passion for psychology. It, it runs in my family. Um, you know, my mom was a, a psych major. My sister is a practicing psychologist. My aunt is. My other sister had a major in psychology. So we, it runs in our family. And once I started looking into like personality psychology, along with 
nutritional science, it was like, I don't know why more people aren't talking about this because we can gain insight into neurotransmitter balance based off of personality traits. So if I know kind of what's going on between the ears and I have a sense based off of my personality, well, that can give me some pretty great information in terms of what's going to help me feel my best when it comes to nutrition. And an easy way to just kind of conceptualize that is for somebody who is a little bit higher anxiety, typically from a neurotransmitter standpoint, they're going to have lower levels of serotonin, possibly lower levels of GABA, which are neurotransmitters that calm the brain down. So if those levels are lower, they're going to be a little bit higher anxiety as, as a you know personality trait. So for that person, maybe a low carb plan isn't the best option because carbs will help increase serotonin, help decrease cortisol, can help with that anxiety. So now you start to see like, okay, the application makes sense. If I know a little bit about this person, who they are, um, I can gain insight into what's going on uh, from, you know, from a brain chemistry standpoint. And then I can start to make some pretty accurate guesses as to the approach that's going to work best for that individual. Yeah, that makes complete sense. So are there any categories that you have that you kind of like, like overarching categories that you feel like you just mentioned one kind of higher anxiety, uh, maybe a little bit less, you know, serotonin. So carbs would maybe be advantageous for that person. Are there any other categories that you have? Yeah, so we kind of look at it as like, what's the neurotransmitter or nor neurotransmitter system that drives the majority of that person's behavior. So if you have somebody who's like very extroverted, outgoing, risk taker, very competitive, typically that's gonna be driven by dopamine. Um, so they're gonna either have high levels of dopamine or be very sensitive to dopamine. Um, so either way, you know, somebody who, if you're extroverted, if you're a risk taker, um, subconsciously the, the pleasure response because you're sensitive to dopamine is worth the risk of whatever could potentially go wrong. And that's often seen in addictive like behavior. So somebody who might be more prone to drug addiction, just as an example, uh, once they feel that dopamine response from, from using, then uh, they want more of it. And then when it's not as intense because they start to desensitize their own dopamine uh, system, then they, they need a more intense version. And, and then that's how, you know, addiction happens. And I'm just using drugs as an example. It could be, you know, it could be alcohol, it could be gambling, it could be pornography, whatever it may be. Um, so for somebody who's more dopamine driven, um, that's kind of one category that we look at. Um, I mentioned serotonin um, as kind of the other end of the spectrum for somebody who's a little bit more high anxiety. Uh, most of their decisions are based off of protection and feeling safe because they have lower levels of serotonin. So they like to be structured. They like to be organized. They like a plan. They like routine. All of that helps to ease anxiety. Um, then, you know, we kind of look at adrenaline for people like myself, where um, we have, you know, I have a heightened response to adrenaline. So when I'm not activated, when I'm not like, when I'm just kind of, you know, lounging, around doing my thing. I'm very introverted. Um, you know, I don't like if you saw me uh, in a different context, like if you just walked by me in the street, I'd probably have my head down. I probably wouldn't say anything. I'd be very internal. I'm, I'm a little bit more shy and introverted. But if you get adrenaline activated in me, like if I'm in the gym or if I'm out at a bar and there's music playing or whatever, and I'm in my environment, now all of a sudden the adrenaline comes up and I'm like this totally different version of myself, a more extrovert, more talkative. Um, so then we have people like myself where um, because of our adrenaline sensitivity, we crave variety. Um, we, we like to bounce around to different things because once something becomes repetitive, well, it loses that adrenaline response. It's now routine and you're not getting that same stress response from something that's new. Uh, and so that's why we, we kind of crave variety. And then we also group um, glutamate is the other neurotransmitter that we really look at, which is kind of like the emotional amplifier. So we have individuals, personality types that have high levels of glutamate, which tends to, you know, kind of they're more prone to emotional decision making, emotional eating, binge eating, using food as comfort, that sort of thing. So that's kind of like the the overarching themes that we look at. And, and we can get really like deep into it with each individual type. But that's kind of like just looking at it from a high level. Yeah, I would love to to dive a little bit deeper into those the different ones. Um, if you're if you're up for that. Yeah, for sure. Um, cool. So yeah, we, we break it down into five different personality types. So with with dopamine dominance, um, essentially meaning that dopamine is driving most of their behaviors, uh, we split them up into two categories, type 1A and type 1B. Um, 
and and by the way, this was um, you know Christian was uh, my mentor who I learned from, and then kind of went off and did my own research and kind of put my own spin on it because he's more on like the the training side of things, where I'm more passionate on the nutrition side of things. Um, so we have type one A, type one B. They're both dopamine dominant. A type one A personality, somebody who's very outgoing, very extroverted. Somebody's like, they are who they are and they don't care what anybody thinks. They, they love to argue. They love to compete. Uh, somebody who takes up a lot of space, like they come into a room and you know, they're there. Um, and, and that type of person, uh, the type one B is similar in that they're also extroverted. Um, and they're also competitive. Usually they're naturally athletic, naturally explosive. The biggest difference is that type one Bs have higher levels of acetylcholine, uh, which is responsible for basically like brain communication, multitasking, skill transfer, um, you know, explosiveness with the muscles. So they're usually like naturally athletic when you see like a star wide receiver or just like, uh, you know, like a LeBron James type. Um, usually it's a one B. Uh, they because they they learn new skills very easily. They are good at multitasking. They like to be challenged. Um, like they get bored easily if they're not challenged mentally. Uh, so that'd be the person in the gym who loves to do like supersets and keep the exercise moving. They don't like to sit around very much. Um, and they're more of a lead by example person. Uh, they're a little bit more empathetic than a type 1A. Type 1A is just kind of like they are who they are. They don't care what you think. Type 1B, um, they're going to be a little bit more empathetic, more of a lead by example type. Um, and, and definitely more like imaginative, um, and that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. type two, a, which is my type Sorry, Did you have a question? Oh yeah. I was just going to say, so for that, for that general category, how, how would you kind of, and this is probably a very specific question and based off of the individual. And then obviously there's all the different factors as well, besides personality that plays into this, but, um, how would you kind of structure a nutrition plan for someone who's in that category versus, the other ones. And I don't know if this, if you can answer this question like straight on, cause Definitely. it's individualized, but yeah. Yeah. So with the caveat that everybody's different and we're going to, there's going to be some like adjustments to be made, but for the most part, we look at it from the standpoint of, you know, dopamine dominance. Okay. And then we also have to look at their um, inhibitors when it comes to their neurotransmitters. So like I said, serotonin and GABA being the two main neurotransmitters responsible for calming the brain down. So we have neurotransmitters that amp us up and we have neurotransmitters that calm us down. So dopamine amps us up, adrenaline amps us up, uh, glutamate amps us up. And then we have serotonin and GABA and, and there's a lot of neurotransmitters. So I'm, I'm generalizing the main ones that we look at. Um, so with a type one, a, their main inhibitor is GABA. Um, so what that means is that they have high levels of GABA, which sometimes they can come across as almost like lazy um, if they're not like they're, they're very competitive, but if they're not competing, then they're almost just like, you know, seemingly lacking motivation because they have such high levels of their inhibitors. Um, you actually have to amp them up. Like when you're going into the gym and you're like ready to train, typically that's when uh, dopamine has surpassed your inhibitors. And now all of a sudden you're activated, you're in that training zone. Um, so for a type 1A, uh, because they have such high levels of inhibitors, if we were to give them, let's say, a high carb plan, they're going to drive serotonin up their inhibitors up even more, which would make them almost come across as even lazier. Like they, we want almost the opposite effect. So looking at it from the perspective of if I have like more protein and fats in my diet, I'm going to favor the transport of L-tyrosine over L-tryptophan. L-tyrosine being responsible for increasing dopamine, um, L-tryptophan being responsible for increasing serotonin. So for a type 1A or a type 1B, where we're looking at, all right, we want to increase the dopamine response for this individual, we're going to be looking at more protein and fats and maybe a little bit lower to moderate carb intake because we want to favor dopamine support versus serotonin or GABA because they already have pretty high levels of their inhibitors. Um, so that's kind of like the general theme is like, let's err on the side of protein and fats. Carbs can be a little bit lower to moderate. Um, they also have higher capacity for stress because of their inhibitor. So, you know, uh, like a type 1A can handle heavy neurologically demanding training because high levels of GABA, they're able to kind of calm down their nervous system after a workout, where is if you did that with somebody who's 
already higher anxiety and they have something that's very neurologically demanding, it's going to be a lot more difficult for them to get back into a parasympathetic state just based off of their brain chemistry. So that's kind of like the overarching principle when it comes to nutrition for a type 1A, type 1B. Um, type 2A is, is my, my neurotype, my personality type. Um, we are adrenaline dominant. And like I said, we're, you know, because we have low levels of adrenaline at, at rest, but we're highly sensitive to it. We kind of almost come across as like multiple personalities because, uh, you know, if we're not activated, we're going to be a little bit more introverted, but once we get that adrenaline response, it's almost like an alpha version of ourselves and adrenaline is, is, you know, the stress response, but it, it's also, you know, you'll have higher levels of perceived confidence of strength of blood flow. So, um, you know, based off of our response to adrenaline, uh, we like variety. Once something becomes boring and repetitive, we no longer get that, that adrenaline kick from it. Uh, we're also people pleasers. So like our, our motivation is to get the approval of others, to get the respect of others. So, um, we definitely take on the personality of people, either like a, a mentor or a coach or a teacher, somebody that we have respect for, um, based off of the fact that we like that approval, we like to get recognized, uh, and that's kind of what drives our behavior. So when you're looking at nutrition, when you're looking at training, um, I kind of live by the, the motto that everything works, but nothing works for very long. Um, and that's kind of been my background. So you can kind of do anything with a type 2A, um, but you always have to remember that inevitably they're going to get bored. Um, it's going to become repetitive and they're going to look for the next thing. So rather than letting them just like go off as a coach, rather than letting them just go off on their own and be like, all right, I'm going to try something else now, like having something that's built in with variety. And it doesn't have to be like a dramatic shift altogether. Um, so oftentimes with like training, for an example, you know, you can still do the same exercise, like my last program, um, you know, I had back squats and then the next, um, next training block was back squats with a six second eccentric. So just like mm. that little bit of an adjustment was enough variety to keep me engaged, but we don't do anything really for more than like three week blocks. Um, and then kind of same thing with nutrition, uh, typically two A's will do really well with something like calorie cycling or carb cycling or having, you know, you know, you have a certain prescription for the weekday versus the weekend, just anything that kind of gives them that variety that they crave. Um, but there's like some logical progression built into it. Yeah. That's super interesting. I feel like I'm definitely that type as <laughs> just <Right>. like you, <laughs> yeah. everything you're saying, I'm like, yeah, that's me. That's me. Um, super interesting. So are, and then you said, so those are two. That's three. Yeah. So those three. three types. So then we also have two B. Um, those are the people that I was talking about with high levels of glutamate, which essentially is the emotional amplifier. Um, it also plays a role in memory, uh, but two Bs have high levels of glutamate and often low levels of GABA because we actually, um, they convert into each other. So glutamate converts into GABA, GABA converts into glutamate. So it's difficult for them both to be high at the same time. Um, and because of that, two Bs are a little bit higher anxiety. Um, they have typically a little bit less capacity for stress. Um, so interesting, a, a ketogenic diet actually increases the enzyme that converts glutamate to GABA. So mm -hmm. it's the GAD enzyme. Um, so if you're in, in ketosis, you'll, your body will produce more of that enzyme, which can help them feel better mentally because glutamate comes down, GABA comes up, um, but it can also cause some problems because it'll, it'll decrease serotonin. So I have found that as like a very short term intervention, it can work well, just mentally. Um, but typically for a type two B because they're emotionally driven, they're often like the bodybuilder types where they love to like feel their muscles working. They love the pump. They love like the mm -hmm. sensation. They love the positive reward of like, Oh, I did a good job because I'm sweating my ass off. And like that gives them that, that positive feedback loop that they crave. Um, so typically they do really well with more of like a bodybuilder style of diet and training where it's more like pump work, mind muscle connection. Um, and then with nutrition, just kind of like what you would think of a bodybuilder's diet where most carbs are around training. Like they're getting their pre-workout carbs, their post-workout carbs, so they can feel their muscles working during their session. Um, and that seems to be a really good protocol for them. Um, and then the type three is what I mentioned uh, with the higher anxiety individual who is very organized, very structured because they have low serotonin. 
Um, and for that person who's like the planner, uh, they do really well with more of a high carb, low fat diet, just because it's going to help them with um, getting serotonin levels up and keeping cortisol managed. Um, typically, having carbs kind of spread evenly throughout the day, um, just so in case there's any like blood sugar issues, having just like small frequent feedings of, of carbs throughout the day. But that's kind of like the, again, with the caveat that everybody's different, mm -hmm. those are some of like the overarching principles. Yeah, that is like super interesting. I've never really heard it broken down like that before. So I just learned a whole bunch. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, awesome. All right. So I want to switch gears just a little bit um, and kind of chat. We, we chatted off air about some of the things that we want to talk about today. And personality was the big one of the biggest things. So I'm glad that we kind of went down that rabbit hole. Um, but the, the next thing I want to talk about was kind of um, this concept of, you know, a lot of people hear people talk about, you know, you can't lose weight because you've been dieting for so long or you've been under eating for so long. So you need to actually eat more to lose weight. Right. And so that concept, I feel like it can get very, um, confusing for a lot of people and they don't really know how to kind of break it down and, and assess like what that actually means. So maybe we can talk about that a little bit, like why, um, like over the long term, if you are kind of stuck in this, you know, dieting restriction, kind of camp, you've been in a deficit for who, whoever, like how for a long time, right? Which a lot of people kind of fall in that camp. Um, and what is like the, what are the benefits of actually kind of getting out of that deficit, maybe eating a little bit more for a longer period of time and how that can set you up for success um, in the long term? Yeah, for sure. So there's, there's a couple ways to like break this down. The first example is the person who has legitimately been in a deficit for way too long. Um, and if you just, you know, a, a calorie deficit is a stress on the system. It, it's just, that's what it is. Like we're moving away from homeostatic balance. So when we move away from homeostasis, your body compensates and it adapts. So when you impose a stress on your system, the objective is to have the proper environment for a positive adaptation to occur. So when we train, when we lift weights, the stress that we're imposing is we're breaking down muscle tissue. The adaptation that we want is to build bigger muscles. When you impose the stress of a calorie deficit, you want the adaptation of losing body fat. What happens is when we try to do that 24 seven, 365 days a year, like the example of the chronic dieter who's always in a deficit, well, then your body is like, okay, the acute stress, the short-term stress was okay. We started to see some fat loss, but then it's like, well, this stress isn't going anywhere. Now it's chronic. And we evolved where the only chronic stress that was really a threat to our survival as a species was, was famine. So we see a lot of the same adaptations because we're still running the, the same hardware um, you know, that, that we evolved with. So you start to see things like metabolic downregulation. You start to see the immune system depressed. You start to see thyroid lower. You start to see sex hormones lower. You start to see all of these adaptations occur that basically it's like, okay, there's a lack of nutrients coming in. There's a lack of energy coming in. The last thing in the world that you want, if you're not eating enough, is to have a roaring metabolism because you would starve faster. So your body is very smart and adaptive. So it starts to compensate appropriately. Um, a lot of people view that as like, and I'm so frustrated. I'm eating 1200 calories. Why is my body rebelling against me? It's not rebelling against you. It's doing exactly what it's designed to do. It's protecting you. It's keeping you alive. It doesn't care that you want abs. It cares about <laughs> your survival. Um, it's also not going to create the environment to bring a baby into the world when there is all this stress present. So that's why you see loss of cycle or, um, you know, sex hormones are, are out of whack, things like that. Um, so for that individual, it's very simple you either keep banging your head against the wall and not making progress and being miserable on 1200 calories, or you go in the opposite direction and you restore that homeostatic balance, which is where you would just, you know, a lot of times people think of it just in terms of calories, like, okay, I have to get my calories up. Yes, that's part of it. But I like to view it more as like a stress barometer. Let's mm -hmm. mitigate stress in all areas. So if you're overtraining, well, now we can pull back on training, that's going to help with, you know, some of the stress coming off your system. If you're not sleeping well, if we can improve sleep quality, if you have anything that you can do from a self care standpoint, going for more walks or getting outside or, you know, playing with your kids, whatever it may look like for you. Nutrition is another part of it where we should probably get you back to caloric maintenance and hang out for a while and let those adaptations kind of, you know, fix themselves, give your body time to restore 
homeostatic balance, almost like sending the safety signal, like there's no more threat, there's no more famine present. Now, once we stay there and hang out there for a while, we can go back into um, uh, you know a short-term deficit. And I say short-term because I think that for the most part, for the majority of people out there who want to lose body fat, they try to stay in a deficit for way too long. Um, my approach is like, get in and get out. Like, let's make mm -hmm. it quick, quick and, you know, easy. So um, that's kind of like the, the one scenario. Um, oftentimes, there's a different scenario where people are in the dieters mindset, but not actually in a deficit. So they think that they're under eating because they think that's what they need to do. So they're probably under eating five days out of the week. And then they're either binging on the weekend or they're like snacking or they're picking food off their kid's plate and they're not really aware of it. And there's just this subconscious habit because your body's trying to, again, get what it needs. It wants energy, it wants fuel, and it's trying to find it in ways that, you know, to, to, again, to keep you alive. But in that person's mindset, they're like, well, I've been dieting so hard and nothing's happening. By eating a little bit more, you start to find those, those poor habits uh, dissipate. Like you're not snacking as much, you're not binging as much. Now all of a sudden there's more balance to be had and you start to see like, oh my God, it's amazing. It's magic. I, I ate more and I started to lose weight. Well, it was just that you were, you know, had all these subconscious habits that were doing more harm than good. And by actually giving your body what it was asking for, there was less stress. You know, there was, there was more balance and, and you just found a more sustainable way of doing it. So um, those are kind of the, the things that I look at. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times with uh, depending on the approach and how extreme it is, we often see situations where people diet and because they're on super low calories, they're, they end up losing muscle, which then, you know, muscle is the most metab metabolically active tissue. So you're now impacting your metabolism in how many calories you burn at rest. And that can make it very easy to regain weight. So then you end up in this yo-yo cycle where you diet too aggressively and too long and you end up losing muscle and you end up impacting your, your, what your maintenance calorie should be. Um, and that can create mm -hmm. a scenario where, you know, you end up regaining it. And again, the solution is to spend more time at maintenance, to not be in a deficit for as long and to not be as aggressive in your, you know, in your deficit. Yeah, that makes sense. So how do you, from like a psychological standpoint, because I know this is something that I struggle with a lot too, with, with my clients and like convincing them to, to get out of the deficit and convincing them to get out of, um, you know, just chronically dieting, chronically, chronically being in that kind of restrictive mindset. How do you approach, you know, convincing your clients like to kind of get out and spend time at maintenance and, and help them to do that. And maybe, maybe we can also talk about kind of like the, the all or nothing mindset, how, you know, that plays a role in it as well. I know it's kind of a different topic, but maybe we can go down that rabbit hole a little bit. Yeah, for sure. So it's a great question. Like, you know, when you have a client and they're like, Hey, I want to lose 20 pounds like yesterday. And you're like, great, we're going to eat more for a while. You're not going to lose weight. We're going to restore maintenance. You're like, I don't think you heard me. I want to lose 20 pounds like now. So yeah. it's a great question. Uh, I always look at it as I want to guide them to the answer on their own while, you know, kind of asking good questions. And I feel like, you know, I learned pretty quickly that coaching was like more about effective communication than it was about how much I knew about nutrition and training. Um, so it's really just asking those questions. So getting them to realize that what they've been doing hasn't been working. And once I can kind of throw stones at their approach, now they're open to hearing like, oh, okay, you're right. This hasn't worked. And I've been doing this for a really long time. So I'll ask them like, uh, I actually had this conversation today. It's like, how long have you been eating 1500 calories? Well, like the last few years, got it. And, and how's that been working? Are you, are you moving towards your goals or, or where are things at? Like, no, I've been completely stuck. Cool. So do you think that if we kept eating 1500 calories that that would change? No. Cool. So do you think that we should do it something different? Yes. Great. Do you want to hear what that is? Yes. And now I've got their, their buy-in to say like, okay, I know that this isn't going to work because it would have worked by now. So what's that other thing? It's like, has anybody talked to you about your, your metabolism? Well, no. Okay, so then now I can like go into a little bit of education. And then like, do you think that if we got your metabolism to a place where uh, your body was no longer trying to preserve body fat, but it actually felt safe, because we restored balance, we restored homeostasis, and we got you feeling better, 
you actually had more energy because you told me that every day you're like surviving on four cups of coffee and you, you know, could actually perform better and felt good in the gym. Like, does that sound appealing? Yes. Great. So do you think we should take the time and, and go that path before we cut more calories? Yes. And now it's just like asking the questions to get them to the answer without, cause you know, sometimes people are, are combative. So if I'm like, Hey, this is what you need to do. Uh, like now, you know, I really just want to lose, I'm going to go find a coach who's just going to cut my calories and give me what I want. And like, even though they'll end up learning the hard way, um, you know, just through like asking those questions and getting them to see that the other path, they've probably tried it a lot before. Um, so it's like, I'll hear this, you know, I'm just going to go back to what worked before. Like, okay, help me understand when you did the 1200 calorie program, when you say it worked, what do you mean by that? Well, I lost 20 pounds. Oh, cool. So you're, you're at your goal now. Well, no. So what happened? Well, I gained it back. Okay. So do you want to lose 20 pounds and gain it back? Because if you do that 1200 calorie plan is perfect for you, <laughs> but if you want to keep it off, do you think we should try something else? Yes. Okay, great. So now your goal is to lose the 20 pounds and keep it off. Cool. So do you think that we should have something that's a little bit more sustainable? Yeah. So it's just trying to like break down the stuff that they already know through like hard evidence that yeah. it doesn't work. Now we like open the door for a new conversation and then being able to like throw in the education side of it to say like, now that you're bought in, let me explain why. Mm -hmm. Now they're more receptive to the why and they can hear, you know, oh, this makes sense. I never thought about it like that. Got it. Now they're even more committed. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, asking questions and just the education, explaining this, the, that side of things and, and everything is super important. And that's something that, you know, I, when I work with a, a new client, I always say like, I want you to ask me questions. Like that's the last, the last thing on their, you know, intake form every week, their weekly check-in is like, do you have any questions or like, how can I help you this week or whatever it may be? Because that is where we kind of unpack things. If you're just telling them what to do and not even telling them why they're doing it, then it's like, okay, that maybe they'll follow it for a little bit, but if they don't understand the why behind the what, then it's just, you're not, you're not adding any sustainability to that at, at all. And I think this is something that I also face a lot too. Um, cause I work with a lot of clients who are coming out of the, the keto low carb space and like they've been keto for a long time and all the things that you're saying relate to that as well. Cause it's like, I, I did this initially and this is where I was, I did this initially, it worked, um, and now it's not working anymore, but I'm afraid to, to do something else. I'm afraid to like bring carbs back in or whatever it may be, or try, you know, a different training plan versus the cardio and all of that. So I love, I love how you kind of put that in the sense of asking the questions and just continuing to kind of unpack that. I think it's super important. Yeah, definitely. And it like, it helps them learn because then when they're answering the questions, they hear themselves say it like, oh, you're right. That actually didn't work. And like the, the language that they're using makes a difference because in, if they associate temporary results with it working and like, we need to reframe that. We need to mm -hmm. actually get to the root of the fact that they want sustainability. So, um, you know, it just helps to kind of bring things to the surface and it's more their decision, right? Like as coaches, we can guide people, we can educate, we can inspire, but we can't force anybody to do anything. So it has to be their own buy-in, their own, you know, decision. Like, you're right. I don't want to go back to that. I want something that's mm -hmm. going to actually help me long-term. Yeah, for sure. I've also found, you know, showing them the plan, like kind of looking at, okay, this is, this is what we're looking to get to a year from now. And then like reverse engineering that can be very, you know, beneficial for the psyche because you actually see like, okay, this is where we're going or this is at least where we want to go. And these are kind of the steps that we have in place to get us there. It's not always going to be exact, right? Nothing's ever like exact. We have an overarching kind of macro plan and the, the tools we're going to try to use along the way, but things will change and all of that. So I think that's another thing that can help with kind of the mindset side of things. Um, yeah. There is one of the questions. Oh, sorry. Just because you touch, anytime I hear something like psychology related, I have to jump yeah. in. It excites me because that's how our brains work. That's It's so effective because we love to know start date, end date, and expected results because our brain mm. craves certainty. We like anything that was like unpredictable was was a threat, you know, from, from an evolutionary standpoint. Right? So when we have something that's, that's certain, that's predictable, our brain latches onto it. So when you, that's why challenges are so um, appealing to people because yeah. it's like, 
six weeks, I know the duration or eight weeks or whatever the challenge is. And it's like, lose 20 pounds in six weeks. Like everybody's like, oh my God, I'm in. I know the start date. I know the end date. And I know the expected result. Sign me up. So, and then obviously that's not the most effective strategy, but why it's so appealing because it, it touches on that psychological drive to know those things. So when you have like, you know, a good coach like yourself to say, here is the game plan that I've, I've mapped out. You're giving them kind of what their brain craves and helping them kind of grasp. Like, it's not just, all right, we're going to jump into this process and then head into the dark and we don't know what's going to happen. You're giving them that certainty that helps kind of put them at ease to be like, all right, I've, I've, I see the start, I see the end. And here's the expectation, knowing that things can change along the way, but at least you give them that, you know, up front. Yeah, for sure. I think that can be super, super powerful. Um, the last kind of topic I want to touch on with with this as well, um, this kind of goes into it, is chatting a little bit about like the kind of perfection versus consistency mindset type. So I do work with a lot of clients who I feel like, and this used to be me where it's like, if I'm not perfect with my macros, if I don't hit my training sessions every single week, like I feel like you know, I failed that week. Is there anything from like a psychological standpoint that helps you to um, kind of explain to your clients that like, especially when it comes to transformation and and weight loss and fat loss and, and even building muscle, that it's not the perfection that, that makes the difference. It's the consistency. Yeah, for sure. Uh, one of the things that I love to do is um, just kind of get a sense of their perception of failure. Uh, because oftentimes that's where it starts. It's like a fear of failure um, and and like holding yourself to this, you know, it, it's a standard that is basically unachievable because perfection is not achievable. So when once we start to see like, what are, you know, what are your thoughts of what, what would happen or, or what would you say to yourself or how would you feel if you did have an off day um, and you made some poor decisions, uh, if the weekend got away from you, like trying to hear how they would describe it or what they've done in the past. And oftentimes it's like, well, you know, in the past, I would beat myself up, I would feel really guilty, I would go off the rails. And then I would start again, Monday, or I would jump on to, you know, a new program, and I would try and recommit. And that process would, would start over again. So you start to see some things about like their perception of failure, that kind of sticks out and um, trying to reframe that, like, using other areas of their of their life, you know, have you ever failed at anything before? Or like, what do you do for a living? Oh, I do this. Oh, have you ever failed? Like, was there any project that you did where you didn't do it perfectly? Or when you first started, were you like completely proficient? Or were there some things that were, were a struggle for you? So you start to pull from other areas of their life. It's like, okay, so when you fail, like, what did you do? Did you go off the rails and not show up for work for four days and then say, I'm going to start work again on Monday? Or did you figure out what went wrong and fix it from there? It's like, well, yeah, I guess I've kind of figured out what went wrong. I fixed it from there. Like, cool. So that failure actually helped you to make better decisions in the future, right? Yes. Do you think that that's the same thing that we should be doing with your nutrition? Should we be embracing those failures? Should we be learning from them? It's like, okay, that makes sense. Um, so one of the things that I tell everybody off the bat is like, I'm going to just be very upfront with you. You're going to fail and you're going to fail a lot. Like, let's just get it out there. Let's just, you know, be on the same page about it because there's no use hiding it. Um, so once I kind of try to reframe what those failures look like, and then I'm like, this is going to be the most important part of the process. When you're dialed in and everything's going well, that's cool, but that's not going to be where we grow. We're going to grow when you make a poor decision or where you judge yourself too harshly or whatever happens. Like there's going to be moments where you're going to feel like crap. You're going to feel like all the hard work went out the window. And that's the stuff that we're going to lean into because that's where you're going to get better. You're going to grow, you're going to learn. Um, and we're like, you know how that played out in your career because of where you are now. And, you know, sometimes I'll use sports as an example and depending on their background, just trying to connect to something that they already know from a different area of their life and pull that, that growth mindset into their nutrition, their fitness and that sort of thing. So um, that's a big part of it is like, and then just, take perfection off the table right away. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you know, I, I kind of find like, we're going to, we're going to use these opportunities to, to learn and grow and evolve and you're going to fail and that's okay. That's the time that we need to get better. Um, so that's like really a big part of it. And um, you know, the biggest thing is like, as long as you keep moving forward, consistency is going to be the most important part of this process. And consistency is not perfection. Um, having to go over the fact that there's more than just an A or an F when you grade yourself, like mm -hmm. you went to school, 
you probably got a B, you probably got a C at times, whatever. Like there, there were other grades that were on the table. It wasn't an A or an F. Yeah. And like most people who are perfectionists, they have so much trouble living in the middle and getting them there is, is important. Like knowing that if whatever happened, whatever you think happened, it probably wasn't an F and you immediately give yourself that grade just because it wasn't an A. It's like trying to get yeah. them to understand the middle ground and, and embrace the middle ground is very challenging, but it's also important. Yeah, I never even thought about it that way. That's very, very interesting. I'm kind of just thinking back to myself, like I was like, try, I tried to be a straight A student, you know, through high school and, and all of that. And I got super, you know, down on myself if I got a B plus or something. And I'm like, wait, now I'm like thinking about that in my nutrition and training. And it did kind of evolve into that. And so it's, yeah, definitely get obviously learn throughout the years and, and, and realize that that, you know, true transformation is you're going to get the C's and the D's and that's just part of the whole process. Um, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for breaking it down like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I feel, I feel like that's one of those things where we have, you can, you can definitely pull from it experience and then realize that for some reason I found, and I think that, you know, there's perfectionist tendencies that we have as personality traits, like I'm that way. Um, but for some reason, nutrition is one of those things that even for an individual who's not usually a perfectionist, when it comes to nutrition, that's like one area that we always try to place that unnecessary pressure on ourselves to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to have those conversations about like, what failure actually means and why it's a good thing and how we can learn from it and how, you know, the middle ground is kind of where the magic happens. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Middle ground is where the magic happens. Awesome. Cool. Well, I think we should end there. Cause that was, that was great. Um, thank you so much for breaking all of that down. It was, I learned a lot. I know the listeners are going to learn a lot. Um, I do like to end on one question and then we can also talk about where everybody can find you and anything fun that you have coming up. Um, so the last question I always ask is, is there, and you can take your time on this, is there anything that you've changed your mind about in the past year? It can be related to anything at all. It doesn't need to be nutrition or training and why? That is a really good question. <laughs> um, I feel like I have changed my mind about a lot of things lately and I'm trying to like something in the last year that really sticks out to me. Um, you know, I would just say that this is going to be a super random answer, but no, I would say, go for it. I would say that I've had in the last year, more of an open mind about like economics and financial policy is something that I just randomly started to get into. Um, so I think that um, that's something that I've kind of changed my mind about, about just like the, um, the way that I've personally like prioritized my finances and, and, and like that sort of thing, like my, my spending and savings and all of that. I kind of feel like I was set in a very certain way or like certain structure for like most of my life that I never really questioned just because it was how I was brought up. And over the last year, I feel like I've had a complete overhaul of like my mindset there. So um, mm -hmm. that's one that stands out for me. No, that's cool. I mean, I put you on the spot there. So that's a great one. Cool. So do you want to tell our viewers or listeners, um, where they can find you, your podcast, um, maybe social handles, all that jazz. Yeah, for sure. So um, I think the easiest place to connect would be Instagram. Um, it's at coach underscore Mike underscore Milner. Uh, my podcast is wherever you listen to podcasts and it's mind over macros. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, those are the two best places. Um, you can go to neurotype training.com if you want to take the personality assessment and see what type you are. Um, but yeah, those are all the places to, uh, to find me. Sweet. Awesome. Yeah. I will link all of that up in the show notes and I'm probably going to go take that quiz, um, when we get off here, cause all that stuff was super interesting. Um, awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat and I will chat with you soon. Thanks so much for tuning in to another episode of Metflex and Chill. I hope you enjoyed it. It would be awesome if you could give the show five stars and leave a review on iTunes. We're trying to get placed in the top 100 health podcasts and the five star ratings and reviews are what can help make that happen. I'll add step-by-step -step directions for leaving a review in the show notes. I know it's a big ask, but it really helps. Thanks again. See you next time.